They wanted me to show them how to invert a dictionary, even though I did like that three times at least in class. Uh, okay, uh, so you sure nothing? No questions. Okay, so this is the last topic we're going to be covering because I hope you guys have know that we really only have two or three weeks left of classes. Um, December 5th is the last day of classes inclusive. So there are classes on December the 5th, and they are the last ones. Uh, so we're going to have three more lectures, including this one of new topics, and then the rest of the classes we're going to have like review. Except I want to figure out somehow a way of like polling you guys to figure out what topics you want me to sort of recover. Uh, I'm not just going to try and teach you everything. That's going to be overwhelming. So uh, I think list was or list of lists. Maybe I can cover. Anyways, if some of if some if someone out there has an idea of how I can poll the class to get like a list of topics. Huh? Yeah, but I need to know like what do I put into the survey monkey? It's like I almost need to do a preliminary ask. And then, like, from that, make a pool of, like, the top five. And it's just like, I don't want to. I'm too lazy for that. Um, so maybe you guys can, like, talk amongst yourselves and give me two or three topics you want me to cover. Or argue it out on Piazza or something like that. Remember when, yesterday when I was telling you that um, about Merge Sort? And how I was being like, please don't post this on Piazza, asking if I have to learn this? <laughs> It's like, I die a little bit inside every day. <laughs> this is, I pr precisely asked you not to, I know it's probably none of you guys, but like, you, you're like, oh no, it's certainly no one will go post this to be as of now. It's like, no. Without fail, dear professor, do I have to learn? No, I guess you don't, right? Uh, yeah. We're not going to recover cover recursion. We're going to have to go, that's going to be something that we're going to have to go through quite carefully. Um, so don't worry about recursion yet. Although I love recursion. Hopefully one I I used to teach logic at the other school and those things are very very close. So if only I could teach you guys lo uh, recursion, that would be a really cool course. Do. Well, I, I don't get to make these decisions. I'm not even a full time hire, right? So I may not even be here two years from now. So you guys, are not, I'm not a, I'm not tenure track. I'm I'm in a temporary contract, right? So after two years, they're going to evaluate me and see if they're going to hire me for another two years, and then after those four years. Then they'll evaluate me to see if I can stay forever. So, yeah. If you guys want me to stick around, you're, you're going to have to, like, I, I actually don't think you have any power regarding this. <laughs> so, you just got. Yeah, you can, you can give me high evaluations, but, like, I'm not telling you to give me high evaluations. I'm saying high evaluations would be good evidence to the department to keep me. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I'm not telling you to do would be to look up on UTM's website to see if there are any teaching awards that you can nominate me for. Again, I'm not telling you to do this. Just saying, if you want to keep me around for your third and fourth years, this wouldn't be a bad idea. Right? And furthermore, it's the humanities that always win these awards. And it like really triggers me, right? Because I've been nominated for these before, and what they do is they send someone to your classroom, like a random undergraduate, uh, to like evaluate you. And like they put them in a like, history class, and that student leaves, oh my god, I learned so much about history. That was all understandable. And then they send me to my class, where it's like a third year math class at like three quarters into it. Oh, I didn't understand a single thing that this professor said, therefore he must be terrible. I'm like, oh god damn it, right? Like, maybe you should have been here for like the three months up to this point where I've been carefully defining all of these terms, but whatever, I'm not, I'm totally okay with it, right? I'm not angry at all. I'm going to have to cut this all out of YouTube because I don't want proof that I was like telling you guys to, anyways, I'd love to continue being a teacher. I love teaching, so let's all hope that they decide to hire me and let, let's actually learn now. So last topic is object-oriented programming. I think some of you have already done it in Java, yeah? Yep, yeah. You're going to hate Python-style object-oriented programming. Because um, there's, there's, you're going to hate the self-command. But in, in any case, so I've talked quite a bit about these programming paradigms. Uh, because programming sort of keeps branching into different types of programming. So you guys have only made one branch once, right? So there's a lot more to learn. There's a lot more of this tree that you're going to have to cover. So what have you guys been doing? Well, the two higher branches are imperative and declarative programming. And in imperative programming, the programmer tells the computer what to do. Right? And there are two ways to tell the computer what to do. You tell the computer to group instructions into functions. This is called procedural programming. And if you, in addition to tell the computer to group instructions, 
you give these groups of instructions persistent state memory, then that becomes an object. Now what I mean by persistent state memory is this. Suppose you wanted a function that could count the number of times it was called. Currently you wouldn't be able to do that without using a global variable, right? Because every time a function returns, it, all of its variables are lost, right? And the next time you call it, all of them are reset again, right? So in this way, uh, if you had a function that could remember the number of times that it was called, it would have persistent state memory. For you C programmers, you may have used the static variable. Um, no? OK, then who cares? Um, so basically, you have. OK, so it, that's like halfway to, to objects. So uh, I just want to mention that the word imperative is an adjective meaning to give an authoritative command. Right, so this is a sort of a meaningful name to pick for this style of programming. So we're going to talk about the secondary branch, this object-oriented programming. And it, I need to say that you can do nothing with an object-oriented program that you can't also do with a procedural program. This is not giving you any extra power. This is just giving you a different way of thinking and codifying a problem. So that is organized, right? This is just going to allow you to think differently and encode the solution in a different manner by defining objects and the relationships between those objects rather than an instruction and a relationship between those instructions. So it's just a different way of thinking and staying organized. And I hope you guys are beginning to appreciate now that your programs are getting a little bit longer. Good thing that there was a lid on that, right? Uh, what was I saying? Oh yes, your codes are getting longer, so I hope you're beginning to appreciate that staying organized is important, right? That having meaningful variable names, meaningful definitions, that you shouldn't just have I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, right? That the more carefully you are with writing your code, the more probable that your code is correct, right? So this object-oriented programming is just going to help you organize your code. Just so I could mention the other branch, the declarative branch, um, because you guys, by the end of your career, will need to know how to read and write in all of the various styles of programming. Right? Again, you guys have only done one out of all of the possible ones. Uh, you're right, you'll probably gravitate to, towards some type of paradigm. I personally like the functional paradigm the best because it's very close to math. Um, so in declarative programming, this is a totally different way of thinking than in imperative programming. So I said in imperative programming, you tell the computer what to do. In declarative programming, you ask the computer for something, right? So a good example of a declarative programming language is like a database. You're not telling the computer what to do. You're saying, can you give me all people who failed CS108 uh, three years ago, right? That's, that's a question. That's not, that's not an instruction to do something. That's me declaring a, a need to the computer. So when a programmer declares what they want, uh, you can, you can make your ask in at least three different ways. Functionally, through a series of functional applications. And that's functional programming. In functional programming, uh, just to give you an impression of how much of a uh, mode shift you'll have to make to program in other languages, functional programming doesn't have loops. Right? So can you imagine trying to program without having access to loops? Right? You really have to change fundamentally the way you're programming. Um, you also have logical declarations. That's exactly the type of declaration you'd make uh, to a database because it basically you give it a predicate and it compares that predicate to each person in the database and gives you back the ones where that predicate evaluates to true. And then finally, you can just sort of spit math at the computer. You can say, the solution I want is the optimal solution to this equation. Please just go run gradient descent on this. Right, so mathematics is maybe the most powerful way to describe what you want to a computer. So anyways, you don't need to worry about this being tested or understanding yet. You will come next year. Right? So in object-oriented programming, the fundamental building block is the class or object. Right? So I'll use the word class and object interchangeably, but they are synonymous. And the design principle here is to solve a problem by abstracting the problem into a series of objects and then figuring out how these objects interact with one another. So an object, in particular, is a collection. So I said an object is a function plus state memory. So the object, the object's state memory is called a field or an attribute. 
And an object's functions, an object's instructions, are grouped into something called methods. Right? So we're, we're going to have to be careful between when we call something a method and when we call something a function. Both method and functions take input and return output, but only methods are in objects. And the only thing a method can uh, act on is the object itself. A function, on the other hand, can take anything and spit out anything, including an object. Right? So functions and methods are different. You'll only find a method inside of an object. OK, so here's the first object. I'm going to do it in the uh, terminal instead. Where am I? Uh, move all of this stuff out. Uh, touch objects. Code objects. OK. So let's just make an object that can is basically just a point in space. Right, let's, it's not going to be a very useful object. So class point, and there's going to be a special function here called the initializer. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing about objects, which are quite important. Right, this is the second time I've forgotten this. An object knows it exists. An object can have statements like change me. Right? This method should change the object itself. Right? So there is a notion of self to objects. Right? That's why I keep doing this. And this is why you Java programmers are going to hate this, because you're going to have to write self everywhere. Right? So if I want to initialize values here, whoops, this is wrong. It should be like this. Now, these double underscores have a special meaning. Uh, remind me at the end of class to tell you why. I don't want to get distracted. Um, so I can say um, the object's attribute x gets set to 0, and the object's, object's attribute y gets set to 0. OK, now what can I do? So let's go into Python. Let's call in this object. So I can say, here's my first point, p. Uh, it's e you can't see. Who can't see? Nice. I thought you millennials uh, always asking for too much, wanting to see, wanting me to speak clearly, wanting to be graded fairly. My God. Okay. So here's p a point. What is p? Oh, it's an object, right? So. When you print an object, you're just going to get this spit back at you. Oh, OK, well, here's the object. It's at memory location this. The cool thing about objects is you can actually write an additional function, sorry, additional method that instructs Python how to print it. Right, so next week, I want to define a matrix class uh, with the extra uh, method in it that tells it how to print it to the screen. Because I think it would be cool to have matrices print properly right, in a nice you know, square manner. Um, so anyways, we'll deal with that next week. The type of P is an object, right? So this is the closest you've come to defining a new type, basically, right? because you have a new type of class object. Uh, what can I do now with this P, right? Because I keep, you're like, that's not very useful. Um, I can access the attributes of the uh, object like this using this dot. That says it's 0. That will say it's 0. I can increment these things outside, and that gets 2. Now, I can have multiple points, right? So I can have another point. And notice that here, it's still 0, 0, right? And I can change this attribute to 100, and these points are different, right? So I really have two separate points which have the attributes, the x position and the y position. OK, let's change this a little bit more. So I can put here now int x, int, oh, wrong language, x, which is an int, y, which is an int, and I can say this. right? So now I can create points with default values more easily. And in fact, if I have two points like this, 
eventually we're going to be able to tell Python how to do arithmetic on this. Right? I can tell Python, listen, when I give you two objects and plus, this is what you should do. And the thing that we should do basically is return the sum of the x positions and the y positions. But not yet. That's what we're going to do next week. But in any case, uh, I can create default values uh, by passing them in like this. So notice, self.x and x are different. Right? The self.stuff are the class attributes. Right? So whenever you're affecting yourself, whenever you're changing the state of the object itself, you have to use self. And this is why I predict it's going to annoy all of the Java. I hate this. There's selfs everywhere in the object. It's kind of annoying, but that's the system. OK, so I've done that. OK, so now I'm supposed to ask you a motivating question, but I've already given you the answer to the question. Right? So I'm going to ask you about how, what is, I've talked about this before, about data representation, about what is the best way to store the information in the computer. And we learned that depending on how you make, how you store the information, it's going to make processing that information harder or easier. Right? That, so to say something more compactly, a good data representation may make an easier answer. And a bad data representation may make it impossible. So suppose I want to store a group of students right, and store data about them. Name, ID, GPA. How would I do that? Oh, yes. OK, that's, yes, that's the correct answer. But uh, I want to stumble there. So pretend I didn't tell you about classes. OK, I can change the question. Without using classes, using only methods that we've learned in Python up till now, how would you represent the data? How? Be more specific. So like this? Yes. OK, so uh, you guys didn't do the worst one first. You skipped to the second worst one. So smart class. Um, OK, so I'll deal with this suggestion first. So one of the things that we can do is have a dictionary where the name is the key and the value is a list of GPA and the user ID. OK, so problems with this. Um, the attribute order has to be memorized. Right? You're saying, I'm putting the GPA at the zeroth position. But that has to be communicated. Right? The fact that the list positions have meaning uh, that are hidden is a problem. Right? If I reversed all of these things, it would sc screw things up. Right? Um, so suppose the student ID was like 3.7. That, that couldn't be the case. Right? So uh, you have to memorize the attribute order. Uh, there's not really a good way to compare students. Right? You'd have to walk this whole dictionary to find the student with the greatest GPA. Um, and you can't support multiple types of students. Right, I can't add another attribute if I wanted. Right? All students have to have only GPA and user ID in that order. And so these are a bunch of deficiencies with this. Um, let's step one backwards. I can even make something worse than this. I can store a list of triplets as lists. Uh, but this conflates the attribute order problem. Right? Now I just added another attribute. And you need to memorize that attribute 0 is name, attribute 1 is GPA, and attribute 2 is user ID. You need some sort of pivot table. Um, so this has even more problems than the thing that came after it. Uh, when you key into it, it's, it the, the key name is useless. Right? To get the GPA of like a student would be like data 7 of 2. Right? And that's when you're programming that, you're like, what the hell is data 7 of 2? You have to go then and figure out where stuff is moving. Uh, OK, so this is the worst way. This is the second worst way. Who answered this? So. Could you improve your dictionary method somehow to address the fact that uh, the attributes shouldn't have to be ordered? Pardon me? Uh, but I mean in terms of data representation rather than processing. So it was a good idea to key name to something. So why don't you like move with that idea? Okay, he's too. Pr yes. Nested dictionary. Just take your idea and and recurse with it, right? So I can say I have a name, key, 
which keys to a dictionary, which has the key GPA and ID. So now I can say stuff like, uh, I want data on Paul's GPA, right? Triple dictionary, okay. It's not a bad way of doing it. However, it gets messy, as I assume you guys are discovering, right? To make dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries, it, you, there's a lot of, it's like a lot of plates that you have to keep spinning, right? So although it would work, there's so much extra energy that goes into trying to like keep things in the right place that we don't want to do this. Uh, also, if you want to make a modification to this, it's very hard. I can't add easily like another attribute or anything. So the answer to this question would be, oh, we should use a class, right? Have a class, student class. This is why I hate the word class, because now I want to have a class class to put the students in the class. I want to have a class student, which I, which I can put in the class class of students. Right, so I'm sorry, it's not my fault this terminology is confusing and that this is the best canonical explanation of it. Uh, so we talked about our first object. They want us to implement the student class. Okay, so let's just talk about students. Class student. And what should we do? So maybe we need, well, not maybe. We definitely have to define the initial routine, which initializes this student. It has to get itself. Uh, so what attributes did we want, right? We wanted name. Should be, I don't know, empty. Self dot. GPA is uh, oh, yeah, zero, and self dot user ID is zero. Maybe this should be point zero, and maybe I should call these in. Name is a string, GPA is a float, and user ID is a integer. And then this should be name, and then this should be GPA, and this should be user ID. Okay. Let's see. Huh? Goa. Okay, so I can create a student. Uh, so let's say student is a st of student object. Uh, the name maybe is me. What's the highest GPA you can have? Oh, yeah, well, I got a five. That's how good I am. Uh, and I'm student zero, right? Okay, so printing it does nothing, uh, but I can still access the individual attributes. Okay, and you see how like the names here are a lot more meaningful when programming. Student dot name. Oh, Paul. Student dot GPA. Oh, five. Student dot student dot user ID. Zero. So they're much more meaningful. Yeah. They're called in as strings. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no type checking in Python. <laughs> so that's, that's why that worked. Uh, student ID, GPA. OK. Uh, right, so like now we can, and we're not restricted to having just one object, right? I can say, oh, okay, yeah, create students. Um, and just make this a list of student objects uh, with this default, and I don't know, make 10 of them. How many objects students zeros? Oh, I have to give it a name. Uh, temp. Uh, temp. Okay, so now I have 10 student objects. And I can say, give me the zero student, what is the name? Temp zero. What is the user ID? Zero. What is the GPA? Zero. What's the name of the student at the KS fifth position? Temp five, right? So again, like we could do all of this stuff with other data structures. But this is a nice way of like making it very clear what pieces of attributes you're utilizing and returning. 20 minutes. Uh, have I done a class method yet? No. OK, so let's do this one. Uh, so we just have a person. And let's say person has a first name and a last name, which is a string. 
string, uh, self dot first name, is first name, self dot last name, is the last name. And then I can make a method uh, called uh, print me that maybe says something like print hi. My name is first name, last name. Self dot first name. Self dot last name. So I hate self. Uh, return none. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Whoops, you can't see again. Jeez. Okay, let's read in this object. Oops. Let's read in these objects. Return none. What? Why are you complaining? Oh, Mr. Bracket. Okay, so I can say, um, let's create a person, P. This person is, let me think, slim, shady. And I can say something like p.printme. Now this won't work, right? Because print me is a method. So this is gonna, so when you see this, this is saying, okay, here you go. This is, this is the function that you asked for, right? The function. This is the function applied, which is different, right? So remember, if you want the function to actually do something, you have to say brackets, right? It's called, I call you, right? So in the, in the first one, you get a pointer to the function. The second one, you actually instantiate it. So you can p person dot print me. Hi, my name is Slim Shady, right? So this is an example of how to use a class method. How much time do I got? Okay, not too bad. Okay, so. Um, it's hard to appreciate object-oriented programming until you design a piece of code which is very, very big and which you're trying to solve a very specific problem for which objects are a good analog. Um, so we're going to implement this counter class just so I can show you how we can take a real-world problem and make an analog as objects. Right? So suppose we are referees at a track meet. And we have to count the number of times one, of, one runner makes a complete circuit of the um, track. Right? You sometimes see all these coaches like wearing like seven, seven timers around them right? and pressing the timers for each, for each runner. So I'm saying let's make an object of that counter. Right? You have a real world thing which you can press the button and it will increment the counter by one. And I want one of these counters for each runner. OK, so class counter. I want to uh, come up with some initial values for this. Self. So we can have self dot uh, runner ID, maybe 0. Or maybe I should call it in. The runner ID is an integer. Um, Maybe I want self dot number of laps. Um, set that to zero. That should be enough for now. Um, right. So let's call this in. So now we can have some uh, counter C, which is a counter. Oh, I have to give it a running ID. One. What did I say it was? Integer. Okay. So your running ID is a hundred. Um, so we have the runner ID. And we have the number of laps. Now, how do I increase the number of laps? Not a trick question. Yeah. So I can do this to increase the number of laps. And then look at it. Okay. Now, this is not abiding by object-oriented principles. Okay? We're not setting up objects so simply so we can get the attribute, period. Right? This is close to, like, who programmed in C? Uh, do you know what a structure is? A struct? OK. If, if for any of you who this is meaningful, you don't create a Python object just to get a struct. That, that's very wasteful. right? So, and if that didn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. So in any case, 
this is not how you work with objects. This, this is how you would work with an object, right? So you want to increase the counter. So the counter should have a method which does it to itself. Right? So maybe we can call this click. It takes itself, and what does it do? Well, it looks at the self, it looks at the number of laps, and it um, increments it by one. Okay. So how will this look different in the console now? Well, now I can have a counter. It's a counter object for uh, runner 100. And now every time I see this runner go by, I can click. Oh, he ran by me. Oh, ran by me again, ran by me again, ran by me again. And now we can look at the number of laps, and it gets four. Right? So again, object-oriented programming is just a method for keeping your coding organized. Right? So when you're reading your code, you can see something like, oh, if runner passes me, then counter.click. Right? Your, your algorithm will look more meaningful this way. Uh, so again, if you want to affect a uh, attribute of a object, you should always let the, a method do that for you. It's bad practice to reach into an object and start changing its values. Okay, so what else can we do with this object? Suppose we want to reset the object. That's quite easy. That's just self.number of laps is equal to zero. What else may we want to do with a counter? Get value. Eh. Okay, so we just have a reset. Um, so I could do something like this. Uh, click, click, click. Uh, C dot reset. And then we have C dot number of laps. Right. You really even shouldn't do this. The correct way to get the number of laps would be something like this. Get number of laps. Self return get no, oh return self dot number of laps. Whoops. Uh, C dot get number of laps. Right. So you have an object. You pretend that it's like surrounded. It, like you really should consider your the attributes being sandboxed somehow. Right. So that you should let your objects be very protective of like the things that they contain. Okay. And of course, we can have many counters. So we can have counters. That is a list of objects. Uh, so I can make a counter uh, for this k uh, for k in range ten. So I have ten counters in there, and I can say counter counters. The third counter should get clicked, right? And then maybe the second uh, first counter should get clicked. So counters at one dot get number of laps and counters at three get number of laps. Okay. So I hope you appreciate now that if you were to write a program that was doing something like this, you'd be writing statements like, oh, okay, so like if runner goes by me and if get number of laps is greater than this, then increment, then click. Right? It will read very nicely. Again, I'm not giving you any extra power. I'm just giving you methods to stay organized. Okay, so what I want you to do maybe over the weekend is implement, or how much time do we, I got 10 minutes, I could do this. Um, maybe we should do this together. Okay, so let's um, create a method that, ah, sorry, let's create a class. Jeez, is there a synonym for a class? Like, what is another word for a group of students? <sighs> nice hustle, guys, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you a mob, right? <laughs> You're a mob. Uh, oh, fine. Class, class. Okay, so what do we need in the class? Huh? Cult. I dig it. Uh, okay, so what are all what are, what are our cult members need? All right. <laughs> Self dot gang sign. Right. Uh, 
Uh, self dot uh, catchphrase. Okay. Uh, self dot hates. Right. Right. Got to hate the other. Uh, you have to hate the other cults. Right. <laughs> Screw those guys. <laughs> Gang sign. Um, I, I don't want to figure out the emoji. <laughs> Gang philosophy. <laughs> right. Crime. <laughs> Catchphrase. Crime is awesome. Right. Okay, but th these aren't attributes of the of a cult member. These are attributes of the cult. This is actually not a bad example. Okay. So, like, what attributes do cult members need? Right? Like, I guess they need like a member ID. Even cults are organized, right? So, yeah, yeah. Self dot uh, donations made, right? Uh, okay. So the uh, ranking. Yeah. Okay. Self dot ranking, right? High priestess uh, ID zero. Donations made. Donations made should be a float. Ranking should be. Well, they say that's an int. String? Fine. String. Uh, Grand Admiral. Right? Uh, donations made, let's say zero. Self ID zero. Oh, actually, no, I should. These should just be like this. Ranking. Uh, donations made. And ID. Okay. So we have a cult. And the cult. What? Proof by induction. Okay, so we have one cult. We have one cult. Uh, gang philosophy self dot. Uh, what do we need? We need members, right? And the members should be a list. And the me self dot members should be a list of cult members, right? So this should be a list of objects. Um, okay, so these should all be. Okay, so let's read these in. It should be self. Uh, I'm just. I'm just getting sick of typing. Gang philosophy, uh, catchphrase, uh, hates, <laughs> uh, this is a string, and members should be a list of objects. So I'm just going to put list. Uh, so this should be gang philosophy, uh, catchphrase, Scarborough, it hates, and this should be members. OK, so this, is, this is perfect. This is perfect, actually. Um, Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to be able to add a member, right, to this cult. So how do we add a member? Well, we take self.members, and we have to append to this. Uh, you can't see, yeah. Uh, we have to append to this a member, right? New member, which should be of object class, which I don't actually know how to type, so I'm just going to leave it like that. Um, so self.members.add new member. Great. Um, what else do we have to do? Execute member, right? right. Uh, how do we? Re so I don't actually know what to do here. So we, ha we have to remove the gang member from the gang, right? So for for uh, this member in uh, self dot members, if member is equal to self dot members. Then I have to execute this member, which means how do I remove something from a dictionary uh, from a list? Well, that's only if it's at the end of the list. Yeah. Self dot members dot remove. No, it's not at the end of the list. Huh? Uh, let's just see. If I have x's is one two three. X's dot remove two. Perfect. Um, now that I just did this, do you guys realize that all lists are, are actually objects? I just called the, uh, an object method on list. You guys have been using objects this entire time. Right? Anything that you've used dot something is actually a class method on that object. Uh, OK, no way. Yeah. Mind blown. OK, let's see if this will work. Okay, so let's leave this. We have object. Uh, oh, double equal. 
great. Okay, so what do I need to do? I need a cult member first. So member one is a cult member. Uh, what do I have to do? ID is zero, donations made, I don't know, maybe I made a hundred bucks, and my ranking is what? What? Alco? Alco? All right. Uh, alpha rank, right? Uh, maybe we have a we have a second member. Godfather. Godfather. I'm making you an offbeat account of this. Yeah. <laughs> Coming on the day of my daughter's wedding. I happen to love the Godfather. Ever watch the uh, Zootopia? There's the Godfather mouse. You come here and you make me a rug man of a skunk's bump. Huh? Okay, so we have two members. Uh, now I need to make a cult. Okay, so my cult's, what's my cult's name? Skunk Gang, right, is my cult. He said it, it's done. Uh, what's, huh? Scum Gang. Which one, I, what, you want a K? But with a K is so much more lead. Okay, so, uh, okay, what's our gang philosophy? Huh? <laughs> Never mind is our gang philosophy. Uh, what is our gang catchphrase, right? Proof by induction, Proof by induction or death, right? <laughs> right? What do we hate? <laughs> I could get down with that. Uh, okay, and we don't we don't give members. Okay, well, I, I made a mistake, so I'll just give it the empty list. Okay, so we, we have our gang, right? So now I can take, uh, oh, I'll just do one thing. We'll take our scum gang, and we'll add a member. Well, okay, we'll add a member, member one. We'll add a member, member two, right? So both of these things now are members. So I can look at the sc scum gang, and I can look at our members. There are our members, right? Two objects. Uh, now I can sc scum gang execute member. I feel really bad about doing this, right? So which member are we killing here? All right, I don't want to mess with the godfather, right? And look, that didn't work. Okay, well, figure out why that didn't work. I think it has something to do with file pointers, like looking, looking through a list for an object rather than pulling it out. But it, maybe fix this over the weekend. Oh, maybe. Yeah, well, I'll figure it out. Okay, see a skunk, skunk gang. Remember, induction or death. 